All right, everybody, in the 2023 recommendations, I am first gonna take a little review of the major brands, and then we will dive into the specific camera recommendations. I wanna first look at the different brands because when you get into the different brands, you're getting into a specific lens mount, and that means you're getting into a whole ecosystem of lenses and bodies, and each one has its own pros and cons, as you will see. Let's start off with Canon. Canon has probably been the largest manufacturer. They usually take the top number in sales for most years. Right now, Canon is seemingly focusing primarily on their full frame mirrorless system. This is a relatively new mount, the RF lens mount. Uh, came out in 2018, and they are rapidly bringing out lenses and cameras in this field, and it is quite clear from all their introductions as well as what they do say uh, to the public that this is where they are going to be bringing forth lots of new equipment. So this is probably one of the safest arenas to be in if you are a mid to fairly serious level photographer. On the lower end, they don't have too many affordable cameras, but they are bringing out some affordable lenses. So it looks like they might expand this category in the future as far as the more affordable options out there. Now there are current cameras out there. The, uh, the R5 is probably one of the most popular ones out there. This is a fairly high-end, fairly serious camera. Uh, a lot of people like it. The R6, now in the Mark II version, has also been very popular because it's a little bit lower megapixel. It's a little bit better for the everyday enthusiast. It's also good for a lot of professionals who just don't need the extra resolution and frills that you might say the R5 has. Now, they recently introduced the R7 and R10, which uses the same RF lens mount, but with a cropped frame sensor. Now, the problem was is that they didn't have any cropped frame lenses, so they brought out a couple of cropped frame lenses. They do have a number of full frame lenses that you can use on these R7 and R10s. You can actually use any of the R lenses on there, but you are kind of paying more for those full frame lenses than you really need. And so uh, if history is any lesson here, it's likely that Canon is going to just make a lot of full frame lenses until you will just use those on your crop frame camera. Uh, so the problem with the R7 and the R10 right now for some photographers, I think, is that there are not a lot of good wide angle lens choices. There are some very expensive, great options as far as the full frame lenses, but they're not custom designed and as wide as you could might like to have for the R7 and R10. The R7 and R10 can make really good cameras, especially for people who do want to use telephoto lenses, sports, wildlife photography, things like that. R7 is great camera for that. It shoots very quick and you can use all the longer lenses designed for the RF mount full frame cameras. And there's a fair number of those at this point. The kind of weird thing here, and this is definitely a weird thing if you are new to photography or new to Canon, is Canon makes another collection of mirrorless crop frame cameras that are totally incompatible bodies and lenses mount-wise from the other items I've just talked about. And this M system, the EF-M system from Canon, is something they introduced many years ago when they wanted to have a system that was designed to be mirrorless and very small in size. It's very limited in scope as to the type of user that this is for. This is more of the casual photographer. You're not going to find big, expensive, professional lenses in this EFM mount. They have a unique lens mount, and you do need to use these EFM lenses there. There are adapters that allow you to work with their DSLR lenses, but you cannot use an RF mount lens on an EFM mount camera. So these are kind of two very separate categories. A lot of us in the photography world have thought that this EFM mount is not going to last forever, but we'll see. Um, it's currently still there. If you want something small and simple, it is going to be smaller in size than the RF mount because the whole system is designed to be quite small in size. Now, Canon had a great heyday in the world of DSLRs, and their EF mount DSLRs were the big game in town for, well, 
close to 20 years. Uh, there is a diminishing number of bodies and lenses that are being available by Canon in this DSLR field under this EF mount. They have fantastic cameras. They're getting a little bit older. Their latest 1DX Mark III is a relatively current camera, but the other ones are starting to age. And they have moved all their production and design and development over to the mirrorless system. And so these are some of the last great DSLRs out there. They do make the EF mount in a smaller crop frame as well. It uses the EFS lenses. And so you can share lenses back and forth if you have that crop frame body. And so they've made a lot of these. In fact, I think their kind of last recent mistake is that they made too many EF mount cameras. They started cutting the line a little too narrow between one style of user and the next style of user. So there's a lot of options, especially on the used market. But this is something that Canon appears to be abandoning in many ways. We're not seeing new introductions of new lenses or cameras in the DSLR field. There's been almost nothing in the last three years in this entire category. So it's definitely focused on the mirrorless around the RF mount. And so that's generally the safest place to go in the future. All right, let's take a look at Canon's big rival Nikon, at least for many, many decades. And like Canon, they had four major categories as far as mirrorless, DSLR, crop frame, and full frame. Nikon is also focused on full frame mirrorless cameras. They don't have a lot of cameras to choose from. They have a nice entry level Z5 uh, that should really be called the Z5.9 because it was so close to the Z6. A uh, couple of enthusiasts, serious professional level Z6 and Z7 on the Mark II version right now. And their Z9, which is arguably the best of all mirrorless cameras on the market right now. They have introduced some crop frame versions of this, but they don't have crop frame lenses for the most part. They have a few, a couple. And once again, if history is any lesson here in the DSLR world, Nikon had full frame and crop frame, but they just didn't produce very many crop frame lenses, especially um, high quality ones, professional quality ones. So they have kind of put these crop frame cameras out there as entry level points small collection of lenses, and you're really supposed to upgrade to full frame if you want to get serious because that's where all their serious top of the line gear is. And so there is some compatibility between these because you can use all of the Z lenses on the crop frame bodies, but they don't have very many specially designed crop frame lenses for their crop frame cameras. Now, like Canon, they had a great day in the world of DSLRs. They have a number of very good, well-refined DSLRs still out on the market. They tend to be more on the mid to upper end of the range. They do have a couple of crop frame cameras out there still in the DSLR world. They used to have more of these. You might still be able to find them new. You'll definitely be able to find them used because they did have a lot of different models out there. But just like Canon, this is an area that they are waving goodbye to. Uh, there has been very few introductions with cameras and especially lenses over the last several years. Everything is gearing more towards the mirrorless. This is once again, not to say that DSLR cameras are bad. I love them, they're great. I still own one. Uh, it's just that that's where the market's going and that's where all the new lenses and all the new technology is going. And so DSLRs, it's just going to be harder and harder to maintain for many people who want to keep up replacing lenses and upgrading um, and keeping up with the Joneses, you might say. Uh, but if you have a DSLR system and you're happy with it and it works for you, first off, good for you. Secondly, there's going to be a lot of great deals on the used market and even with discounted new stuff that they're trying to get off the shelves. Well, because so many people are moving to mirrorless, that opens up a very good value in the DSLRs. And so you can achieve fantastic gear for a very good price in this regard. But once again, keep in mind, it's not the direction the industry is going. So fewer things will be available down the road. Now, a relatively new player in the world of serious professional gear is Sony. They acquired Minolta many years ago. And they took some of their equipment and used it as a base, but then they went 
full on with what they wanted to do. And so we're there focusing and they were the first ones to do it really in the current mirrorless full frame world is come out with a large collection of bodies and lenses in this full frame mirrorless. Now they have a pretty good collection of cameras. Uh, the a7C is eh, not the greatest camera in the world, but you know what? It's going to be more than enough for a lot of people who want the smallest full frame mirrorless camera. So that's really quite nice. The Sony a7 IV is a great general purpose camera that you'll see recommended for a couple of different categories coming up. Uh, they make a kind of video specialist A7S model, now on version 3, a great high resolution model, that's the R model. They make a great sports camera, the A9, now on version 2. And if you want just the best of everything, the A1 takes the latest, greatest, and best technology out there. So they do have a pretty good collection and most of these cameras are pretty high-end cameras. They don't have a base and then an intermediate and a step up and a step above that and a step above that. They have a lot of very high-end cameras you might say. Now they have a very good collection, uh, the best between Canon and Nikon in the cropped frame mirrorless collection. That's because they've been doing this for more than a decade. Now since they've been working on a lot of their full frame gear, they haven't paid as much attention to the crop frame mirrorless and so we're having some cameras that had light refreshes a few years ago and there hasn't been a lot of new developments when it comes to crop frame mirrorless. They do have a new ZV-E10. Thank you for the new file naming, Sony. Appreciate that. Uh, more designed for vlogging, not so much for kind of serious photography, you might say. So we've seen very little action when it comes to new lenses in this regard. And so like Canon and like Nikon, the crop frame mirrorless is a bit of a second class citizen. Uh, they don't get all the new lenses. They don't get the latest, greatest technology in many cases. And you're supposed to go play with the big boys with the full frame if you want all the serious best gear out there. And so this has been a frustration on my part as well as many photographers is that if you generally like their crop frame mirrorless, you're never getting all the options that you might like to have. Now, this is probably the last year that I'm going to be talking about the discontinued cameras from Sony. You see, Sony acquired Minolta, as I said. They had an SLR system. They kind of made a little adjustment to it, called it an SLT. We're not going to get into it right now. Gave it a digital viewfinder. And they have some models that are still out there. So when you go to a garage sale and, see, and you see a Sony lens, check which mount it is because it could be one of these older mounts that is designed for a DSLR style camera. And so these are their last great DSLR style cameras. Fine cameras, but it's just not what Sony wants to do anymore. So they are officially discontinued. You probably cannot find them anymore other than on the used market. Next up is Fujifilm. Now Fuji decided to do something different. They saw a very crowded full frame market with Canon and Nikon and then Sony came in and started producing full frame mirrorless cameras and Fuji, although they've done a number of 35 millimeter cameras back in the film days, decided that it was a crowded market and they wanted to do something a little different to stand out. So they went with a crop frame camera and decided to put all in on the crop frame market. So they use a smaller size sensor that's okay. They still make great quality cameras that can still produce fantastic professional quality images. Now on the lower end of the price spectrum, they do have a number of basic models that meet different criteria for people who are looking for different things under a basic level camera. And they have several higher end flagship potential cameras. Usually camera companies will have one camera that is clearly above everything else. With Fuji, is an X-T5 better than an X-H2? Not really, it's just designed differently for people who want something different but still want that equal high quality. So the X-Pro3 is more of a rangefinder with the viewfinder off to the side. That one's kind of a, a special quirky one we're not gonna get into too much. But the X-T5 is gonna be a hugely popular camera. It's a, a relatively new introduction as of the filming of this particular class. I haven't had my hands on one but I have owned the X-T1, the X-T2, the X-T3, the X-T4. And so I think the X-T5 is going to be another very popular camera. It's got a lot of physical controls on the outside. The X-H2 and the S version of it, two different versions of it, kind of a similar camera, very similar camera with a different sensor in there. 
uh, is going to provide you with either a very fast readout or very high resolution. And these cameras are going to be different layouts for people who have different styles of shooting. So uh, I really like the Fuji system because they're the only company that's taken a smaller size sensor in this 1.5 crop and really said, we're going all in on it and we're going to give you all the best gear. So we're going to give you shallow depth of field portrait lenses. We're going to give you long telephoto primes, long zooms, wide lenses, fast lenses, prim um, primes and zooms of all different ranges of focal lengths. And so if you like that slightly smaller size, if that's important to you, Fujifilm is definitely a place you want to look very strongly at. Now, we're not going to go too far into this next area, which is the medium format cameras. But I do want to mention that Fuji decided to kind of take a different odd step than the other manufacturers who were all doing full frame. They've decided to go with crop frame and then go larger than full frame up to medium format. And so there's a number of these cameras that have a larger size sensor, which gives them sometimes a unique look. And they have their GFX series of cameras. Now these are gonna use their own series of lenses. The lenses generally do not have the variety of options that Canons, Nikons, and Sonys have for full frame. And so that's one of the disadvantages of the Fuji medium format system. I think it's a great system. They have great cameras. Um, it looks like they're continuing to still push pretty evenly handedly on both of these. Usually with the other manufacturers, they kind of focus on one area more than the other, and you just don't get a lot of new lenses and development in one area or the other. In this case, I think it's uh, very proportional between Fuji is that as far as the amount of customer base, they have much more X users than they do GFX users, but the, the GFX medium format are getting some interesting lenses. There's some interesting rumors on the horizon of new things that'll be there. And it's a very good system for people who want something that offers a little bit more than full frame. Next up, let's talk about Panasonic. So Panasonic, to me, who's been in the industry for a long time, is still a relatively new name. They come at this with a lot of video camera and television history. So they're very strong in the realm of video. So they went with the Micro Four Thirds system. That was their main focus for a long period of time. We saw a lot of development, a lot of new cameras, a lot of new lenses, and it was just a really well-supported system, and it was shared with Olympus at the time. So there was a lot of cross-compatibility that really opened up the doors. They opened up the lens mount, and other manufacturers can make lenses. And so Micro Four Thirds, in some senses, is one of the healthiest ecosystems to be in when it comes to bodies and lenses. However, um, Panasonic has decided that they too want to get in on the full frame game. So they came out with a collection of full frame cameras. Uh, they have ones that are a little bit better in resolution, ones that are a little bit more focused in video, ones a little bit more affordable, that's the S5. And then they kind of took their eye off the Micro Four Third system. So we have seen a slowing of the number of new lenses and new bodies with Micro Four Thirds. Now, what is the future for Panasonic? I don't know. Um, they don't have a long history in photography, so are they gonna pull out of it right away? I, I don't think so. I think they've got too much invested in there, but they seem to be slowing down their introductions with the Micro Four Thirds, and it's not been going too fast with the full frame. Now, the advantage with the full frame is it does share the L lens mount with some of the mirrorless Leica cameras. So there are a few things that you can get back and forth, cross compatibility, but neither Leica nor Panasonic is really producing new products at the rate of Canon, Sony, and Nikon. And so they're the type of systems that you wanna get into if you feel really confident they offer a unique set of features for you and the lenses that you want and need are currently available because new ones are very slow to be developed. The crop frame Micro Four Third system from Panasonic is still a great place to go for a lot of people who have a high interest in video. The GH5 Mark II and the GH6 are very, very popular cameras for a lot of people shooting video. There is a lot of lenses that are available in this Micro Four Third system. And 
it has proven to be very good quality for a lot of different types of work. And so there's a lot of things that you can do with it that is very powerful. And so they make an interesting collection of cameras. Now these are still good for still photographers, but it just seems like everyone who has Panasonic or at least a large percentage of them have a keen interest in shooting video. And that's just because Panasonic is very good at video. All right, let's talk about OM System, which was formerly Olympus. And so Olympus sold off their photographic camera division, and this new company is called OM System. And so you're gonna see the OM, which is kind of a traditional naming system with Olympus. And they are starting to rebrand their lenses in their OM1, OM file naming structure. Now, with this new company, there has been a lot of questions. Would they completely fall flat on their face going right out of the gate? Would they come out with a lot of new products? What would happen to them? Well, their first real new product was the OM-1, and this has been very well received. It looks like it's a really nice camera. Um, it's got a whole new menu system in it. It's got new features. It looks really good. Now, the handoff between these two companies, you might say, is relatively recent, so we don't have a lot of history to work on here. Uh, the OM-5 was more of a rebadged version of a previous camera from Olympus, not a lot of exciting steps, so they might have stumbled a little bit on their second step at this point. But Olympus cameras are kind of unique because Olympus decided to go after one lens mount, one sensor size, and that's all they do. And so uh, from OM System, you've got one set of cameras and one set of lenses, and they all work together, and they're really concentrating on working on that, and they're not distracted by any other formats and sizes. And so that's kind of a nice thing about Olympus. Now these cameras tend to be a tad bit smaller in size. The lenses are definitely smaller and most significantly when you get to the telephotos. So these tend to be a very good birding wildlife type photography lens. Um, also very good for sports photography. So they provide some really interesting things there. Now they've also done a very good job with weather sealing. And so if you do any sort of outdoor adventure stuff, uh, OM system is going to be very good for that. Next up, Leica. Now, if you've never heard of Leica, well, they're just a little bit different. Um, this is a German company, and pretty much everything else is based in Japan. Now, Leica's been in business, I think, longer than anyone else. They've been making these cameras for 100 years. Now, they have a couple of different systems. Their traditional system is a rangefinder camera, which we're not gonna get into the specifics, but you're not actually looking through the lens, you're looking through a separate window. And they take one basic mold and they tweak it and they adjust it in many different ways and they make custom versions of it. And their latest camera, the M11, is one of their best cameras ever for sure. In this regard, they made a transition from film to digital many years ago. Uh, a little bit slow getting out of the gate in digital, but it's something that a lot of people have found as a niche product that worked very well for them. Leica products can be categorized as um, expensive. That would be the first thing on a lot of people's mind. They're also very high quality. They're also kind of particular in how they get used. Uh, when I was selling cameras, we found that the Leicas were a little like a convertible car. It's something that a lot of car enthusiasts wanted. Oh, I'd love to have a convertible car go out driving on the weekends. And then they found that um, when they had the convertible car, they didn't actually use it the way they thought they would use it. And so there was a lot of turnover with rangefinders because they're a particular style. Now, that's not to say they're bad cameras. It's just that they're not for everybody. They're a very unique style and a unique way of shooting. There are a number of limitations. You don't have zoom lenses. You don't have big telephotos. You don't have image stabilization. There's a lot of other things you do get. I'm not gonna try to sell you on Leica, but they do have some very great attributes. Small size, incredibly high quality, very simple and easy to work with. Now they still make film cameras. In fact, they recently reintroduced the M6 camera. Originally introduced in 1984, it was so popular they brought it back in 2022. Uh, so they still make film cameras and they're hard to distinguish from their digital rangefinder cameras. But they, along with everyone else, wanted to get into this mirrorless game, and so they started making some cropped frame mirrorless cameras so that people could enter the Leica world on a more affordable scale 
uh, with some small, more up-to-date technology. Now these have not seen a lot of attention as far as uh, new models and new lenses. And I would put a word of warning on this ecosystem. There's just not a lot of options when it comes to this world. Next up is their full frame mirrorless cameras. And these are really well built cameras. They've got some fantastic lenses. They haven't seen a lot of updates and a lot of lenses added to the collection. So it's, it's a boutique collection, you might say. Now, even on the higher end, they do make medium format as well. And these are beautiful cameras. They have some fantastic lenses. They don't see a lot on the updates. And so they fit a very special category of photographer. So like, once again, very unique, very high quality product, probably not your best first camera out. This is something that you want to, you want to work up to for most people. All right. Pentax. Oh, what can we say about Pentax? Well, they are officially owned by Ricoh. That's the actual company that makes them, but uh, they acquired Pentax and they keep the Pentax logo on there, but they're actually made by Ricoh. So they have been the loan company that has decided not to go mirrorless. Um, I'm afraid there was just too many companies making DSLRs and it gets crowded. And there is one of the companies that's typically going to fall behind and that was probably Pentax. The equipment they make is perfectly fine. I've owned a Pentax. They have some nice features. They got good lenses. They have unique characteristics that you may not find in other cameras, but they're not, they just don't have the resources and they're not able to offer as many cameras and lenses out there as the other manufacturers. So it's not as healthy of an ecosystem. Now, actually just before the taping of this class, they introduced a new camera, which, um, was really not a new camera. It was uh, basically a rebadged older version of a camera. They had to replace some parts, some screens had changed and the suppliers were not able to get the parts that they wanted. So they had to put on new parts and they probably had to call it a new name because it's now not exactly the same camera. Uh, so Pentax is not once again, those places I would recommend people buying their first camera. There's some nice equipment out there. It's just not as plentiful as some of the others out there. So let's take a look at the photographic ecosystems that are out there. These are the lens mounts and what's going on. And it's, it's very hard to rate all of these. I was going to rate them all on a scale of, you know, one to 10 or put them in an order, but there's so many things going on and buying into a camera, you're buying into a system. And unless you know exactly what you're going to do right from day one, you want versatility. You want new products to come around. You want used products to be available. Uh, you want something that's going to be available in a wide variety of systems. And so that's why popularity is really important. It's one of the most important things is so that there's lots of different options available for what you might do in photography. You want a lot of different bodies. You want current bodies. You want future bodies. You want a company that is devoted to a mount and planning to develop that mount and approve it for as far as the eye can see. That's a great place to be so that you know down the road there's going to be interesting things that are going to help you progress your photography. Lenses, that is a big part about this whole interchangeable lens camera system here. You want lenses that were made 10 years ago that you can buy. You want lots of current lenses. You want future lenses. You want aftermarket lenses which are lenses made by other manufacturers that are available for your camera. And more options you have, well, more options is just plain old good thing. So let's go ahead and take a look at all the different camera companies and their different mounts. Each of these is a different ecosystem. And I decided to try to group these into just three categories. The first category are these, which is a sparse collection. When you are investing in these mounts, you're not getting a bad camera. You're just getting a smaller ecosystem. The number of bodies and lenses is less so than in the other systems. Now, there's nothing wrong with choosing to be in this category. I have a Leica M camera. Leica M cameras are very, very limited in what they do. As long as you know this ahead of time, and it fits what you want to do, it's perfectly fine. But if you're looking to do a wide variety of things and you want to have the most versatile system out here, I don't know that these lens systems would be the best place to go. Next up, let's call this category limited. 
Now, there's some very good systems in here. The Canon EF system was the main pro system for more than a decade. There are tens of millions of lenses out there, millions of different camera bodies that you can buy, both new and used. But it's not what Canon is focusing on now and in the future. So that's why I put it into the limited category. Same thing with the Nikon F system. Now let's take the Fujifilm G system. That's their medium format. It's new, it's current. It's not something that's hugely popular because it's a very high-end product. And so there's limited introductions and a limited collection of lenses in there. Now the Micro Four Third system on the whole is a very, very versatile and healthy ecosystem. But with OM system, now taking over from Olympus, it's a little unclear where the OM system is going and how well they're gonna be able to support this and develop new products in the future. Panasonic has some great Micro Four Third system, but with their eye on full frame, are they really gonna be coming out with everything that you might want with their Micro Four Third system? All of these systems have slight questions that have people wondering, well, are you gonna be doing much in the future with it? Now, obviously the last ones here, these are the most abundant systems out there where you have companies that are really dedicated to coming out with new bodies and new lenses on a regular basis. You will see lens roadmaps that tell you that they are planning on developing general lenses or very particular lenses down the road. And so you can be well assured that there is going to be new products on a regular basis on these. Now you're gonna see it with on the, other, on the others, but just not as abundantly as on these particular systems. So hopefully that gives you a better idea of kind of the different worlds that you're buying into when you get a particular system. Next up, let's take a look at the specific camera recommendations. Now, before we get into this, I'll have to say that generally speaking, there are no bad cameras anymore. There might be bad cameras for a particular person or particular usage, but there is a reason that cameras are designed in a particular way. The designers, the engineers, the people who built it have somebody in mind, a type of user that would like to have that camera. And when you see somebody review a camera, well, that's oftentimes their personal feeling on a particular camera, and that may not match what you think is important. So don't be too concerned about watching a review where somebody doesn't like the camera you're interested in. That's perfectly fine. I hear terrible reviews about stuff I like all the time. And that's because I've developed my own likes and desires, as I'm sure you have, with cameras. And so I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna to try to describe and share with you what I think are some good cameras for different types of photographers in different categories. Uh, cameras in general, especially interchangeable lens cameras, are designed to do a wide variety of things. But price levels, features that are included, quality levels, well, they are geared for different types of photographers. The first category I wanna look at is what I call the unofficial family photographer. Let's say you have a little bit of an interest in photography, maybe you have a family, maybe you don't, doesn't really matter, and you just wanna take pictures of your friends and family, and you're not gonna get whole hog wild into this, you just want something that's relatively small, not too expensive, pretty easy to use. What do I think would make a good camera for that? Well, let's start off with the Canon R10. This is a very modern mirrorless crop frame camera. It's not too much money, it's uh, very simple in operation. The Canon cameras have easy menus to navigate, very comfortable hand grips, very logical controls that have just been well honed over the years over many different models. Next up, Nikon Z50, probably a pretty close competitor to the R10, very similar in many ways uh, as far as the available lenses and how easy it is to use. Some people like Canon, some people like Nikon. I think they're both really good, but they both have their own different style. I like the Fuji Film XS10. That's one of my favorite here. Uh, we have a camera that is truly designed around this crop frame sensor. Now, all three of these are crop frame sensors. With the Nikon and Canon, you're kind of buying on the back end of a larger full frame system where they're kind of hoping you go full frame. And if your intention is maybe full frame down the road, 
that's where the Canon and Nikon might come in as a better choice than the Fujifilm. If you know you want that smaller size camera with the smaller size lenses, uh, there is a very good collection of lenses that is dedicated specifically for that sensor size in the Fujifilm camera. And it's got a good general collection of features that is pretty comparable. Um, image quality between all three of these, if you were to do a side-by-side -side comparison, is going to be virtually identical. So image quality about the same. A lot of it is the system capabilities and the controls on the camera. All right, what about budget-minded? Just, I don't have much money, but I want to get into photography. Well, word of warning, photography is not the cheapest hobby in the world. Walking would be a great hobby for that. Shoes are not that much money. But if you do want to get into photography, there are ways that you can do it without spending a lot of money, and you can still get some pretty darn good gear in here. Now, the Panasonic G7 is a camera that I don't have a lot of personal experience with. I've owned and used Panasonic cameras, the G7 is a little bit of an older camera, and so it has been discounted at this point in time to become something that is a bargain basement deal right now. So it doesn't have the latest, greatest technology, but if you're just looking to shoot basic photos with a relatively modern camera, yeah, you're going to be able to do it here at a very affordable price. If you like something that's very small in size, the Sony a6100 will get you into a field where there's a lot of growth potential. There is a lot of Sony crop frame cameras and lenses. And then of course the whole full frame system of lenses also works on this. So there is a large variety of lenses and a good upgrade path with the 6100. One of my favorite cameras is actually going to be a good old DSLR camera, the Canon T7. Now this was the most basic of Canon DSLR cameras, but they made it for a really affordable price. And this is something that somebody could really get into photography with. There's going to be a lot of affordable gear, especially if you're willing to buy used because of all of the EF lenses that are out there, tens of millions of lenses out there, lots of different options. And so it's not the latest in technology. It's very basic, but if you just want to learn photography, this would be a very good camera for doing that on. All right. I have split this year's recommendations for the student into two categories. The first up is the student on a little bit more of a budget, somebody looking for a crop frame. And I'm thinking about a photography student. Now this might be a student who is in say high school or college, or it could be a person who's 75 years old that considers themselves a student of photography. But somebody who's getting into photography that really wants to learn and have some growth potential down the road. I like the Fuji X-T30. It's got controls that really make you think about setting your shutter speeds and apertures. Uh, these manual style traditional controls on there, I think it would be a fun way to learn photography. The uh, Canon Rebel T8i or 850 d depending on which market you're in, is one of Canon's most popular series of cameras, the Rebel series, which is kind of their entry level and they've broken into many categories. This is their latest, greatest, best one. It is a DSLR style, which opens you up to the older DSLR lenses, which there are a lot of. Does not get you into the mirrorless, but it is a great way to learn photography on a budget. And if you can afford a bit more money, the R10 is the new mirrorless option. So this gives you the more modern technology, does not give you as many lenses and options in that regard, but I am sure there is going to be many more into the future uh, with the R10. And so that is going to be very good for somebody who's thinking about growth potential down the road, investing in a system that's going to be around for a long time. The Rebel, the Rebel series is something that, well, it's going to be around for a while because there's so many of them, but it's not where Canon is currently producing things new into the future. Now, for the aspiring student, the one that's got a bit more money, that little bit more serious about things, and they want to go full frame. These are going to be more expensive systems, absolutely admit it. Once again, I don't think it's real likely that a, um, a high school student with a weekend budget of mowing lawns um, is going to be able to afford some of these right out of the gate with their first weekend of lawn mowing. Uh, but this is, once again, for a student of photography that wants to get serious about things. The Canon RP is a basic entry-level full-frame camera from Canon. It doesn't have the most amount of features. It's tapered back quite a bit on its feature list, but it does all the important stuff. 
It does so in a small size. It does so in a lens mount that is a very, very safe ecosystem going forward. Kind of the same thing can be said of the Nikon Z5. It's actually a pretty well-featured camera, in my opinion, that's got a lot going for it, including the fact that it shares the new Z mount, which is where Nikon is focusing virtually all of its energy. Now, the best of this is going to be the most expensive, the Sony a7 IV. Now, Sony, once again, has been in the full-frame mirrorless game longer than either of the other big names of Canon and Nikon. So there are lots of lenses, and there are also previous versions. This is something that Sony has done for quite a while. There was an a7, there was an a7 Mark II, an a7 Mark III, and now there's an a7 Mark IV. Now, while the a7 Mark IV is still out on the market, the a7 Mark III is just going to be marked down in price. And there's a fair chance you might be able to find the a7 Mark II marked even further down. And so if you want to save additional money, you can go to a previous version with Sony or any other manufacturer that keeps around their old models. Each company has their own way of doing business. But Sony's has been to keep around those older models at a discounted price. And so the Sony's going to give you the highest resolution, probably the most features, uh, most capability, but it is a bit more money than either of the others. Our next category is the urban dweller. And what the heck is an urban dweller? Um, I, in my mind, I'm picturing the high-tech worker who maybe takes public transportation to work. They carry one satchel with them. They want to carry their camera with their laptop. They don't want to have too much size and they just enjoy photography and maybe they enjoy going out for uh, dinner and drinks after work and they want to kind of walk a few of the extra streets around downtown and photograph what they see and experience. Uh, anyone who likes a small camera that they carry with them is kind of this category here. And so these are very tech savvy cameras, but in a small package. The Fuji XE4 is one of my favorite small size cameras. Fuji makes a whole line of small size lenses to go along with this, which is really nice. The Panasonic GX9, once again, packages a lot of high technology in a very small package. And the Sony a6600, once again, this very small size package for a camera. They do have a pretty good number of small and versatile lenses that fit that system. So all of these cameras, while different prices and offering different features, I think all fit this category quite well. All right, every once in a while, I come across somebody who is taking classes of mine, and you can tell they are pretty serious about photography. They really want to get into it. Uh, sometimes it's someone younger. Sometimes it's somebody who's retired. It doesn't really matter. And when I say professional, it doesn't mean they necessarily want to make money. Quite frequently, they do. But sometimes they just want to be a professional quality photographer, and they want to get into a piece of equipment that is not going to hold them back. And that's kind of where I was when I was getting started. I wanted something good. I was a student, but I was a future pro. I don't want my gear to hold me back. I want my talent to hold me back. I, not really, but I, I, that's the thing that I want to be able to work on. I don't want to be frustrated by a camera. So the Nikon Z6 Mark II, solid camera, always round. Uh, there'll probably be a Z6 Mark III Somewhere down the road, that'll even up the qualities of the features and some of the things that it can do. But the Z6 Mark II is a good, solid camera for a wide variety of uses. It doesn't really specialize in any one particular thing. You can do sports, portrait, travel, whatever you want with this. It's a good general purpose camera. There's a lot of professionals who will use this just because it's good enough or maybe as their backup camera because it just works like some of their other cameras. The Sony a7 IV, not its first appearance, is another great camera here. It's a great camera. It's a jack of all trades. It can handle a little bit of everything. It gets you into the Sony system, which has a lot of different options available right now, of course. The Canon R6 Mark II is going to be another one in the same price point, very similar as these other cameras, very similar resolution. The Sony's got a little bit of an edge on that particular collection. Uh, but this is more about what system you want to get into than what camera is best for you. Uh, we could compare these cameras, these three cameras, all day long, but ultimately I think the decision should be made which system do you want to be a part of. Are you already a part of it now? That would probably have the biggest influence as to whether you want to continue with that or not. But all three of these systems I see as very safe 
going forward. All right, let's talk about people who are interested in video. So filmmaker category here is people who want high video quality, which is actually pretty common in most all the cameras these days, but some just give you more controls over it than other cameras. And so there is this certain breed of camera. In the first case here, the Panasonic S1H, they make an S1, that's a very nice camera. The S1H, is the hybrid camera designed for stills and video. And so there's a lot of extra features that somebody who shoots video is really going to appreciate in here. Next on the list is the Panasonic GH6. Now, as I said before, Panasonic does video and film very well. And so if you want the crop frame version of it, the GH6, this is gonna be a very good camera for a lot of people for different reasons. Gets you into that micro four third system that's gonna be a little bit smaller uh, you're going to be putting it on a gimbal and running around mobile with it. A little bit less weight, a little bit easier to work with. Going to be working in the home studio. Don't want to spend an enormous budget on new gear. Micro Four Thirds lenses are going to be more affordable than the full frame lenses on the S1H. The Sony A7S series has long been dedicated to people shooting video. I don't know if there's anyone who buys this camera who wants to shoot stills. This camera is really designed for people who want to shoot video. It's got a lot of great features from Sony, which specializes in Sony, like Panasonic, does video really well. They have a whole video division. They have tons of film cameras. And so this is an area that these two companies really excel at. The vlogger. Okay, so this is Filmmaker Juniors. Somebody who's just filming themselves, wants something nice, lightweight, easy for vlogging. The Fuji XS10, not really targeted towards this category, but it works really well. Once again, gets you into that crop frame sensor, which gives you a little bit smaller size and a lot of lens options available from Fuji in this case. Nikon has a new camera that is designed for this, the Z30. It's not my favorite camera for still shooting, but for vlogging, it's a nice camera. It's got a lot of selfie controls that are gonna work very well if you wanna flip the screen around and film yourself, whether you're at home, or walking down the street. The Sony ZV-E10 has a number of accessories that are very good for this. Sony's been very good at this style camera. Uh, they have a number of these in different formats, you might say, and so they've kind of nailed this field down quite well. So I think all of these would work quite well in this category. All right, Landscape Pro. This is the person who loves shooting landscapes. You might be shooting from a tripod. You're gonna have a lot of wide angle lenses some very high quality lenses, and resolution is definitely important here. A little bit of durability too, because you might get yourself caught out in some bad weather. So the Canon R5 is definitely gonna be a great way to go here. Getting into the Canon system. Canon has a lot of lenses. If you throw on their lens adapter and use their older EF lenses, you're gonna open a whole world of about 70, 80 different EF lenses that they made which gets you a lot of great options in lenses. 45 megapixels is not the highest in this particular category, but it's more than enough for pretty much any professional use out there in this regard. The Nikon Z7 II is a close competitor, offering a lot of similar features in the Nikon ecosystem. And so there's a lot you could say between these two, but they are both great cameras. Hard not to give the top spot to the newish a7R Mark V. At 60 megapixels, it is enough of a bump in resolution where, yeah, it's going to be apparent when you start making enlargements or you start cropping in. They uh, have had this uh, system refined over the years. As I say, Sony has been in the full-frame mirrorless business longer than anyone else, and this is their most refined model to date, and so it is a very well thought-out system. Next up, the weekend sports shooters. So maybe you've got a little bit more of a modest budget than a professional sports photographer, but you've got something you love to do uh, on the weekends. Maybe it's race motorcycles, go to the track, whatever it may be. If you like to shoot things that move quickly, here are some recommendations. All right, I haven't been making too many SLR recommendations. Nikon does not have a real good sports camera in this category, so I'm gonna reach back just a little bit the D500, this is an SLR camera, DSLR camera, I should say, and it is a fantastic sports shooting camera. There's a lot of great 
telephoto lenses out there from Nikon. And so if you still want a DSLR, if that doesn't bother you, this is going to be one of the more affordable options in here that does fantastic for shooting sports. The Sony a7 Mark IV is not really specifically targeted at sports shooters, but it is a jack of all trades, as I mentioned before. It can do a lot of things really well. Sony is adding more and more lenses to their system all the time. You've got a pretty well fleshed out system that's been around for more than a decade now. And so you're getting into a pretty well honed system with Sony. Canon R7 though, I think is gonna be a very good option in this category. Now this is a crop frame camera and there's not a lot of wide angle lenses available for it. But with the sports shooter, you're interested in telephoto lenses. And so this gets you into the new R mount with Canon. And there are some very good quality and a growing collection of telephoto lenses there. Now this is a crop frame sensor like the Nikon D500. So this makes all of your telephoto lenses a little bit more powerful. Now this is going to offer you the fastest frames per second that also has subject tracking where it can track faces and different subjects. And so for nailing the most amount of in focus pictures per second, the R7 is probably going to take the, uh, the prize with these three. Now, if you're really serious about your budget and you're a pro mirrorless sports shooter, here are the cameras that I'd recommend. Now, the Nikon Z9 is probably the best mirrorless camera if you had to give that title to one camera out there. Now, the only reason that maybe it's not my first choice here is that 45 megapixels is a lot of information to be shooting on sports shots where you might be shooting at 30 frames a second. It's going to make downloads a little bit harder and typically sports shots are not needed at that megapixel resolution, at least at this day and time. But it is a great camera. The Sony A9 Mark II, A9 series from Sony is their sports series. I remember the first time I shot with the original A9, I was shooting some um, aeronautical uh, maneuvers and it was it was game changing it was unbelievable to be able to have constant eyes on your subject having it tracking that subject the number of in focus pictures that i was able to get out of that session was so much higher than everything else that i had done and i had been using some very nice cameras at that time now my favorite in this category and i'm a little biased because i've used it a bit more than the others is the Canon R3. I think this is the perfect balance between the number of megapixels, the type of body. Having that full vertical grip on the camera is really nice. I think that's an advantage. Now you can definitely add it on to the Sony A9 Mark II with their vertical grip, but having it built in, there's just an extra level of strength and simplicity to it. And when you are shooting sports, you are often shooting people. Not always, but a lot of the time. And people generally are vertical when they are doing sports. And so you have your camera vertical. And so it's nice to have a camera that is absolutely comfortable in the hands shooting vertical. And that's where the Z9 and R3 really have a bit of an advantage. And the R3 being at 24 megapixels, at least for me and a lot of other professionals, it's that right balance between enough resolution to do whatever you want and some ability to crop, but not so much that it's really going to bog down memory cards and hard drives with shoots that are in the thousands of photos. Uh, the Canon R3 also has the eye control focus, which not everyone, but some people have found uh, very helpful and interesting to use. Next up is World Traveler. That fits me as well in this category. This one's very close to me. And so when I'm traveling the world, obviously size is a big important factor for a couple of reasons. One, how much you got to carry with you. And secondly, how big of impact you make when you're on the street of some foreign city taking photos. The bigger the camera, the more you draw attention to yourself. And that's not always what you want when you're traveling. So the Sony a7C, which many people, if you watch reviews on this one, will call a very imperfect camera. But I've owned it and I've used it and I can say it's a workable camera is perfectly fine for this category. It is going to be the smallest of the options here. It's got a really good sensor on it. They don't have the most amount of features, and especially the latest high-tech features, but that's okay. It fits perfectly in this category. Now, the Canon R5 is not what I would call a super compact camera, but compared to DSLR standards, it's not that big. And if you wanted to prioritize image quality, high-quality lenses, 
this would probably be the best in this category for a world traveler. It's gonna give you a large, op large number of options when it comes to lenses, and they are gonna be extremely high quality lenses. But my favorite in this category would probably be the X-T5. Fuji, once again, is using the crop frame sensor, and that's okay for travel photos. Generally speaking, this is gonna work out quite well. And this is one of the reasons I'm choosing this is because of the smaller size sensor it means smaller size camera and smaller size lenses. Now this one's also pretty good, pretty good on weather resistance, uh, which also helps. And so there's a lot of great lenses that are smaller in size that you can use with this system. And this has just been one of my favorite travel cameras over the years. And so I am a little personally biased. I've traveled to Cuba and Bhutan using Fujifilm cameras and not taking full frame cameras. And I've been very happy because I've been able to take things into smaller packs. I've been able to shoot with two cameras at the same time more easily because they were smaller to use and the lenses were smaller as well. So I think this is a great system. All right, finally, our adventure trekker. And so every once in a while, it's nice to head out into the woods, maybe climb a mountain, take a canoe ride down a river, and you gotta be a little bit more wary about the weather, size, weight, a little bit more critical if you're carrying it on your back. And so you need the richest package in the smallest size uh, package that you can have. Panasonic G9 is gonna do a very good job at this. If you're interested in shooting video a lot, this might be the best choice. The Fuji X-T5, which we just talked about for the World Traveler, is also an excellent category here. Very good weather sealing, lots of weather sealed lens options. Not all of them are weather sealed, so you wanna make sure that you get those checked out and that you have the right lenses on there. Uh, but I think this is good general purpose one, especially if you like those more manual controls. But undoubtedly the best camera in this category is the OM-1. This is a camera that has a very high level of splash resistance. Lenses, they have a wide variety. Some very high quality ones if you're working in the studio or more controlled environment, but they also have some very good weather sealing on them. So if you wanna take them out on the rivers, these can handle generally a higher level of water intrusion than any of the other interchangeable lens cameras and lenses on the market today. And so I've taken an OM system with me on round mountain hikes and canyoneering um, where I was in uh, some pretty rugged environments. And I found the system wonderful to use because it just gave me the biggest bang for the buck in size and weight. And so I think that is an excellent choice for the Adventure Trekker. All right, the last great DSLRs on the planet are coming from Nikon and Canon. They were the last companies to really be producing a wide variety of cameras. Yeah, I know Pentax's still out there, they're good, but Canon and Nikon really, really moved the ball forward when it came to development of the DSLRs. And so the D500 is not technically on this list here because it's, I think, officially discontinued at this point. Uh, but these are going to be the last great DSLRs. These are the ones that people are going to collect. These are the ones that in uh, 10 years when there's a DSLR resurgence, uh, these are the ones that people are going to want to go back to because these were the latest and greatest DSLRs at a couple of different price points along the way. If you're just interested in what is the top mirrorless camera from the different manufacturers, this is what I would put as the top cameras. Generally speaking, all of these cameras are good at a wide variety of subjects, whether it's portraits, landscapes, action photography, macro work, astro, whatever you wanna do, pretty much any of these five cameras are gonna be fantastic at all sorts of those things there. And so if you just want something that's the best in the category from that particular ecosystem, these are all some very safe cameras that I think are gonna be very versatile no matter what you're gonna do with it. All right, folks, my final thoughts for my recommendations here is that you wanna get a camera that fits your needs and you are gonna be the best judge of what that camera is. I can tell you what they do, I can tell you what they're good for, but whether it's the right camera for you is really up to you. So check the cameras out that I talked about that fit into your category, read more about them, read the reviews, but always read them with the mindset of how is this going to work for me? As I said before, I don't think there's a bad camera out there. It's just that cameras are designed for different people. You need to find one that works for what you're doing. 
If you can at all find yourself a good camera store, this is a great resource, a great place to buy a camera, great place to take your hands and put it on the camera to see how it feels and works in your own hands. Uh, you can read about it all day long. You can watch videos forever. But until you get your hands on the camera and start playing around with the controls, you're not going to know for sure how much you like that camera. So I encourage you, find a camera store, go into it, put your hands on the camera, get some advice and thoughts from other people about what you want to try there, do some test shots, and see what's going to work for you. A little bit of research. You don't need to research forever. You can go too far with this. I can, I can honestly tell you that. You want to do enough research to make sure that you feel comfortable that you know what you're getting into. I uh, have got a little bit of growth expansion, I think is good for most people, depending on where you are and how much you know what you're going to do. But you're going to end up with a good camera that you're happy to work with that is going to be part of a nice system that will give you lots and lots of creativity and fun down the road. So thank you very much for being a part of this guide. I hope you find the camera that fits you better than anything else and get out there and shoot photos and have fun with photography.